Hello, I am Dr. Elena Schlachta, and I am very excited to be chatting with our guest today, Professor Valerie Anderson. She is the creator of the Valor the Anderson Value of Learning model. It is something that she shared with me was created back in 2007, which feels like ages ago. And yet it is a very common model that when we do a quick Google search, we will find her model listed among the commonly referenced models of how to evaluate learning in the world of corporate learning and development. And so here we are today chatting about this model, why it was created, when we might want to use it, and some ways in which it's evolved over the years. So without further ado, Valerie, thank you for being with us today. And just tell us more about yourself and about this model that you created. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Elena. And it's just so wonderful to be chatting with you uh, today. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I started my career in um, personnel, it was called then, and in training and in human resource development. And I had a practitioner career working in public sector and private sector organisations, mm -hmm. mostly in the UK, but many of them represented internationally. I carried out some consultancy work. And of course, in that area, um, all my clients and my customers wanted to know, as did I, about the effectiveness of the work mm -hmm. I was doing. Yep. When I yep. transitioned my career into the university space, I was excited to be asked by the UK Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development to partner with them and to carry out this work into the value of learning. So mm. it was a research-based project mm -hmm. um, and we modelled the work that we did to develop the value of learning model on some previous work that had been carried out in America. Mm. But we tried to take it further and to go more deeply into the issues about evaluation. And the, the, the problem that we were trying to address is that the traditional approach to evaluation at that time, and I would say still very dominant now, mm -hmm is the issue of are we getting return on investment? Mm -hmm. um, do interventions deliver financial value? Are mm -hmm. they cost efficient? Are they cost effective? Which frankly is an accountant's way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me and to others that we needed a more professionally aligned approach to wonder from the perspective of chief executives, not just chief financial officers, right. um, what the value of learning was to them. So that was why we started the work, really asking the question, are we putting our evaluation efforts towards the right objectives? Mm. And are we operating with um, maximum effect? So that was that was really the start of the pro uh, of the of the um, uh, of the work that we did. That's wonderful. And I, I appreciate the call out that while the ROI term and the calculation has its place, um, I often hear in the practitioner space that we confuse the term ROI with impact and outcomes and that the terminology value of learning Let's us imagine what that value might be. And it's not just a simple financial return on investment, though that is important. There are many other values that can come about through learning. And so if you don't mind, would you just take us through you know, the methodology really quickly, because what we chatted about before we press the record button here is that practitioners and consultants have used the model and that's wonderful. That's why you created it. Um, but there might be some variety of um, applications of the model. So if you wouldn't mind, describe for us what we should be doing with this model um, from the solving that challenge of showing the value that's not just about the finances. I will try to do that, uh, uh, Elena. And the first point I really want to make is that the concept of value is defined by the receiver of the thing, mm. not by the giver. Mm. Now, we as trainers are the givers, 
but actually in an organizationally focused context, our senior decision makers in the organization, the needs of the organization, they are the receiver. Mm -hmm. So the premise of this methodology is that the um, value is determined by the organization. Mm. And I do want here to, to draw, therefore, a bit of a distinction. I think evaluation is organizationally focused. Mm -hmm. There are other features in other evaluation models that are more about assessment, which is individually focused. Mm -hmm. Did the individual learn? What did mm -hmm. they learn? Have they transferred that training to the workplace? And so mm -hmm. on. But the focus of this model is very much on evaluation, which is organizationally focused. Mm. Um, so that's, if you like, the first principle yeah. of the model. And um, I, I've, I've always been really very keen to, um, to say, however, the value of learning model is taken forward. The first step is to identify what are the strategic priorities mm -hmm. and what are the expectations mm -hmm. of the primary stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And that's why one of when I when I first developed the model, uh, it had the strap line from return on investment to return on expectation. Mm. So I think a, a principle of the model is to really be clear about what should be evaluated, mm -hmm. and uh, because not all training needs to be evaluated mm -hmm. if some of it's yep. going along perfectly well so what are the organization's priorities and how best should we be evaluating that mm. the second principle is an interesting tension really mm. between different types of information that are useful in any assessment or evaluation of the value of the work that we're doing um, I'm strongly a believer that measures and metrics have a very useful function to fulfill for mm -hmm. very many reasons. Mm -hmm. But do you know, the research that we did showed that um, because how I'll step back a bit. When we carried out this research to develop the model, we asked chief executives and some chief financial officers and chief learning officers, mm -hmm. what their priorities were mm -hmm. for training, for learning, and how they valued learning. And we rarely heard a lot of talk about measures and metrics. They were taken as a given, mm. but very often the expectations of the business were discerned through those water cooler conversations, through processes of communication, so a very strong feature of the value of learning model is to make use of and value all information, mm -hmm. both qualitative, uh, expressed in terms of words, meanings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and quantitative, mm -hmm. expressed in terms of measures and metrics. So um, that's a second principle of the uh, model is that measurement is important but judgment is also important mm. and judgment comes not just from a response to some measures and metrics. Judgment comes through an interactive process right. of strategic alignment. Mm. Um, so those are um, principles of the model that can then be fed back both into strategic decision making, mm -hmm. but also into increasing the value of learning to the organization. Wow. Um, there's so much, before you move on, there's a few things I just want to unpack here because I, the principles are a wonderful way to frame. And this is the challenge as a practitioner. When I look at the spread of models I could select from to help me frame my thinking and my strategy, um, it's really wonderful to have clarity on the principles or the assumptions behind each of these models. And so the one thing I just want to reiterate that you mentioned is that the value is seen through the perspective of the business or of the operations, the organization, which is very different than evaluating or measuring the value from the learners or employees perspective or from 
you know, if you're working in a nonprofit sector, the donor's perspective, it sounds to me, and this is where I might like your clarity, is that if we're using the value of learning model, what we get from that would really be insights to help us improve the organizational function, operations, and maybe performance even. And I wanted to ask, do I understand that correctly? I think, you, yes, you do. Certainly you do. Um, I would want to qualify that a little bit. Yeah. I think we do need to take, um, to take account of the individual learner's experience. Mm -hmm. But that's not the driving factor. Yeah. So we need yeah. a balance. It's not a balanced scorecard, but we do need a balance between making sure that we attend to the needs of the business. Um, and, part, and, some, and for some businesses, that will be because they, they very much function through operational capacity mm -hmm. and capability. Mm -hmm. um, they will need those benchmark and capability measures. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's what we need to feedback. But it could be the organization is going through a strategic change process. Mm -hmm. And that, for example, would then mean that we have to really focus on alternative ways of making that judgment call about the return and the value of, of, of learning against what was expected mm -hmm. of the learning function. So yeah. we, we different organizational contexts will prompt attention i think to different parts of the model um that the model that i developed had four quadrants to it mm -hmm. that tried to take account also of short-term and long-term um benefits of mm -hmm. and value of learning mm -hmm. and um so it is important that the learning function operates in an effective and efficient way mm -hmm. so some learning function efficiency models uh, uh, metrics will always be necessary mm -hmm. yeah. um, equally there will be some training for which return on investment makes sense right um to uh, to ensure that we are getting the best value for the money that we're spending on a defined usually technical form of training mm -hmm. but that doesn't apply very successfully to say management development programs mm -hmm. Um, which um, have their effect over a longer term and in mm -hmm. a less measurable way. Yes. Um, yes. We also have to um, think about the benchmarking of our training provision mm -hmm. and the skill level of employees, particularly in those organisations where that is uh, the unique feature of the organization that makes it the, the competitive strength that it is. That's so right. my argument has always been you take these quadrants, return on investment, return on expectation for strategic change, for example, learning function metrics, benchmarking capability measures. You you focus on which one, which one or two of those is important for your organization mm. and not only do you do that in a very thoughtful way and a consistent and transparent way but you communicate your findings your evaluation um, outcomes mm -hmm. back to the stakeholders in a way that makes sense to them mm -hmm. i must say uh, the thing that upset me most as a practitioner and as a consultant, as an and as an academic, actually, mm -hmm. is the propensity of of learning professionals to use learning jargon right. when they are trying to say how well they've done something, right. rather than communicating back to the business in a language that the business can make sense of in mm -hmm. a sensible way. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. In that. Um, the business has a language and learning has a language and we don't always communicate well with each other. And to your point about tensions, I think that can create a tension and that just like when I'm trying to speak Spanish to my partner and I'm not able to understand um, and when and when he speaks to me, right, it can cause a lot of frustration. And so being able to speak a language and and see through the lens of our stakeholders and of the business, that's a really important skill set. What I love about the quadrants is that it helps us to focus on the different ways we might communicate our value, returning on expectations, return on investment, uh, the learning function and sort of its service to the, to the organization. And then the other, um, 
remind me the other quadrant. I'm visualizing it and I'm missing the gap of the fourth one. We've got uh, I, I, the, the quadrants that I put out. I might over the years, I might have changed my mind about what what's really important. But at mm -hmm. that time in the model, uh, I had learning function measures. Mm. I did have some return on investment measures. I had also return on expectation measures mm -hmm. and benchmarking capability benchmarking. measures. That's yeah. it. But my 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 um, the, the 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 protocol, if you like, of the model was consider business data mm -hmm. and business priorities. Mm -hmm make effective use of both qualitative and mm -hmm. quantitative evidence mm -hmm. and then communicate that information back into the business, uh, communicate the outcomes of evaluation processes to inform further departmental decision or, or business decision making yeah. processes. So yeah. in a nutshell, it's it's really make sure your evaluation processes are fit for purpose mm -hmm. and don't feel that you've got to do all the metrics or the right. measures in the right. world. You make informed choices mm -hmm. and then you stick with those informed choices so mm -hmm. that the organization and you can see progress over time. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier in our conversation that the goal isn't to evaluate everything. And for the things that we do decide to evaluate, we don't need to collect metrics on everything. We just, and I appreciate, what decision is it that we're trying to help the organization make? And that that would be a lens through which we decide what metrics are the priority metrics because evaluation can be costly and it can be uh, time consuming. And if we are great at prioritizing the metrics for our evaluation needs, then that can be a huge reduction in the value of the outputs that we get from that. Um, one clarifying question. So of the four quadrants, if I understand correctly, they all have different metrics that could be useful. How do we are there like a strategic question we might ask? How do we determine which of those metrics in each of the quadrants to prioritize? Because again, you rightly said that the learning function doesn't always speak the language of the business. And yet here we are charged with what metrics might we need to prioritize without enough sometimes or sufficient context or background around how to make that choice. It's, it's a very good question and an interesting question that you've asked there, um, Elena. Um, the first point I would say is it is not really, I don't think it's really necessary to have one, two, three, four or five metrics from each quadrant. Mm -hmm. If our business needs us to focus on two quadrants, that's where the focus should be, mm -hmm. um, provided that that is um, a judgment call mm -hmm. that the business is happy with as well as the uh, learning professionals. And frankly, often learning professionals don't ask the business what they are yeah. most interested in, which is right. regrettable, right. really. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's, that's the first point. The second point is, a, for me, a weakness of our um, training and development or our HRD practice historically has been that we've tended to use data that are easily available to mm -hmm. us yeah. rather than yeah. using the most available data, mm. uh, data, data. Uh, I'm yeah. flipping between yeah. the two. Um, so um, for me, a priority should be on using the data that will really help us to answer the questions we need answers to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those forms of data will be available in the organization, but not in our HR databases. That's they right. may well be held in the finance mm -hmm. um, sphere. And as uh, we move into an area of big data, these questions become much more answerable. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a huge opportunity in um in the future in our field mm -hmm. to really start to develop our skill in analytics yes. so that we can um go look for the data that we need to answer our questions mm -hmm. um, rather than just finding the easiest data to analyze because it isn't yeah. always the most appropriate data 
Yeah. Um, I have done something because if I it, I did develop this model a long time ago, it's developed a bit of a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Different practitioners have taken hold of it and, and different consultants have taken hold of it and developed it in their own way, um, which I am comfortable with. If it works for mm -hmm. organizations and for them, then I'm very pleased to have been a small part of that journey. Yeah. But as I've looked back on that work, mm -hmm. It, um, I have reflected that the value of learning framework that was developed at that time, I think it does and still can speak quite powerfully to the chief executive, uh, the chief operating officer community. I think it can speak to the specialist training and development, mm -hmm. HR development community. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that it speaks so easily to people who are operating in international contexts mm. different from the UK or perhaps from the USA sort mm. of um, way of working. I think some of them have struggled to see how this sort of framework would easily fit into what tends to be a very systematic learning cycle mm. approach um, carried out in, in quite a few um, international organizations, especially where operational priorities uh, emphasize competence and skill levels. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've thought about that quite a lot. And it's occurred to me that there are um, the point still remains that input to any evaluation should be strategic priorities and organizational mm -hmm. goals. Yeah. But after that, I think there are three forms of measures that we should attend to. Some of those are process measures. Mm -hmm. How efficient and effective is our learning management system? And mm. again, increasingly, we are relying on automated systems mm -hmm. um, of, of learning management. So there's, a, there's, there's evaluation territory there. There is also some short-term evaluation metrics that we need, which are more what I would call assessment metrics. How much learning has been undertaken? To what extent were learning outcomes achieved? How mm. has it been deployed in the workplace or in skill levels? And then the third area would be the longer-term, what I call outcomes rather than outputs mm -hmm. focus which is the strategic impact. To right. what extent is our work making the organization um, more change ready mm -hmm. or more able to operate in a sustainable way? Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the three areas where it is important that learning practitioners start to think what measures should we be using mm -hmm. to consistently deal with those those areas so um, uh, efficiency of the function outputs and outcomes mm -hmm. outputs being shorter term outcomes uh, yeah outcomes being longer term yeah what I hear is from someone there's a lot of people who come into my network and they're asking I want to get more involved in evaluation it's not something I'm comfortable with or have a lot of practice with what should I know what, where should I begin? And why I like your four quadrants with, I have to assume then some example metrics. Um, and I know you've written a book and there's probably case studies that we could all look to, to figure out how do we apply this in our organization. But for some of us who are just getting started, or maybe we have a baseline knowledge, but we want to elevate that to help us truly frame and organize data to show value to organizations. Each of these quadrants give us a different place that we can figure out this is the metric that we want and then we can be creative around where do we go to find that data. And as you rightly said, we have data accessible to us in more ways than we can probably even imagine. And so prioritizing what data should we be looking for? I appreciate your quadrants in terms of these are the metrics that might be the most important. And we can always add more complexity later to ultimately show the value of the learning function and our efficiency within inside of that to then be of service to the organization. Um, 
My last question for you here, as we look to wrap up our conversation is, do you have, whether it's a personal example or maybe an anecdote of someone who's used the model and what came about because of it, or maybe what they learned or what they were able to improve because they used this particular approach over another model? I don't know if you have a story on hand yet you might be able to share. You know, I don't really have a story on hand. I wish I did. Um, but my uh, because um, I, I undertook this work, um, I'm, I'm a very committed practitioner researcher. So all mm -hmm. the work that I do is very applied. But ultimately, I took the work. I did the um, develop the model. I, I learned so much by talking and listening to um, chief executives and to chief learning officers from organizations of very different types and sizes. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from them helped to inform the model that we then put forward. Mm -hmm. I know it's been applied in some education settings. Mm -hmm. I know it's been applied in some commercial settings. Mm -hmm. I'm very encouraged that small and medium sized organizations have found it to be useful yeah. mm -hmm. because um, they are the organizations that need to make those inflection points. That's but right. I will be honest with you, once the work was done, I um, continued. I was very interested in the strategic alignment features mm -hmm. of learning and development mm -hmm. but i i wasn't in a position or or, or, or in my career or or in my my uh, life where i was going to make much money from the model or mm -hmm. apply it in practice so as i said to you earlier really it's developed a life of its own that's right and um i'm assuming that it has proved useful mm -hmm. uh, because it is still out there being adopted um, in organizations of different sizes and types. What I will say, though, is the world is changing. We have the big data scenario. We have the data analytics scenarios. Mm -hmm. We're also much more aware, I think now, of um, business risk and continuity issues. Mm. And there's a lot of um, uh, that, that there are useful ways, I think, that this model can be applied Mm -hmm. to ensure that the priorities for the organization to connect it with workforce deployment, mm -hmm. with succession planning, with changes in um, uh, automation and workforce um, composition, mm -hmm. um, and with um, insider threat issues, risk level issues, legal compliance, risk compliance issues. I think there's a lot of scope for the deployment of this model to address those priorities, mm -hmm. um, as well as focusing on things like organizational change readiness measures, mm -hmm. um, level of innovativeness within the organization, individual change readiness. So I really do hope that going forward, this model can play a part mm -hmm. in those sorts of evaluation approaches, because mm -hmm. I think that's what will make the distinction between a business that survives and a mm -hmm. business that actually can thrive. Yep. Yep. Well, as I reflect on our conversation, and I'm so grateful to have spent this time with you for my own nerdy uh, benefit of just learning more about the model and hearing it from the creator's mouth, if you will. But what I hear are calls to action for those listening to this conversation, and I'll share them in what I think are sort of beginner, intermediate, advanced ways of using this methodology. For the beginners out there, I would, from what I hear, Valerie, we all need to be better at speaking the language of the business. And this four quadrant model gives us a sense of what are the ways in which we might ask questions or, or get curious in our own investigation of what's happening inside of a business. And those metrics can give us some of that language to then do our own continuing education to educate ourselves on what's happening in the business from those different perspectives. So if you're a beginner and you want to get better at evaluation, we also have to be better at speaking and, and intuiting the needs and values of the business. And I think this model helps to frame that and prioritize our own development in that way. 
for the intermediate practitioner, someone who's pretty comfortable with evaluation, but still struggles to show anything beyond a learner reaction, which I know we hear a lot, that we want more than just I loved the training. It was a lot of fun. Or um, I learned something. I mean, of course, that's important. Um, but how is that then translating into business impact? These quadrants can give you some focus areas of how to go beyond just the learner reaction um, and focus that. Because I think what should we be measuring is a question for the intermediate practitioner uh, outside of just a learner's reaction. And this helps us us to focus that. And then what you just shared, I think are great examples of more advanced uses of this model. If you're involved in change management initiatives, if you're involved in data privacy protection, risk management initiatives, that this model can also be something to help us to refine the strategy and those more sophisticated use cases. So I appreciate how there's something for everyone here, regardless of your level of experience or sophistication or the needs that you currently have. And I invite all of us to learn more about this model and how we might apply it in different ways. And so my last question for you, Valerie, is where do you suggest people go to continue educating themselves on this methodology? Because we know there's a ton of resources that have been created uh, by practitioners, and those are lovely. But if we want to read or watch or listen to something specific, what would you recommend that people do? Um, I would, um, one, one resource that I would recommend um, are a series of, of um, additional podcasts, Elena, obviously never, never, never competing with yours, <laughs> but um, the Academy of Human Resource Development in the mm -hmm. USA Mm. Um, they are producing now, um, I think they're on series five, um, a set of podcasts which are available um, to listen to and to view, uh, to listen to, they're, they're, they're um, audio recorded. Mm -hmm. um, and they take a whole range of different topics in the area mm. and evaluation certainly features in there. Mm. So I think um, that's a very useful resource. The other area where I would direct particularly the intermediate or advanced user mm -hmm. towards would be the um, writing that's increasingly prevalent about evidence-based management and mm. evidence-based HR. Mm. Because ultimately, this model, I think, was the precursor to evidence-based evaluation. Um, drawing, though, I will say on mixed methods. Mm -hmm. So my, I'm very excited by the developments in big data, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence. But I'm very anxious that that will make us all metrics obsessed and we will forget the other very useful right. information right. that comes from, as you rightly said, intuiting, listening mm -hmm. to what people are talking about mm -hmm. at the top, at the middle, and at the um, sharp end of the organization. Um, I, will, I would also direct people towards um, anything that helps us to become more skilled in data analytics, mm -hmm. because we need to understand better um, what can be measured, who might measure it, and when it is appropriate and ethical Mm -hmm. to measure it yeah um, and my last my last push would be to encourage people to consider thinking about how different standardization processes mm -hmm. international standards um for data um gathering in the training and development field in the evaluation field mm -hmm. might help us to um develop more consistent and coherent and better um, comparative models That's right. so yeah. that we really could compare how we're doing with other parts of our organization mm -hmm. or indeed with other um, uh, organizations in the same sector because that that having a coherent approach to, to measurement mm -hmm. and evaluation is is fundamentally important yeah Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all those resources. I'm eager to check out that first podcast series that you recommended. Um, maybe they'll have me on as a guest one day. Uh, where we can dig into some evaluation stuff from a different lens. Um, 
And what you mentioned at the end was maybe a precursor to another conversation we may have about the, the metric standardization work that's been happening with the ISO. And that it's such a fascinating approach. I think there's pros and cons to standardization. And I agree with you that should we have a more cohesive approach, I think it will help the less mature learning organizations move faster in the maturity models to become more data literate and evidence-based, as you said, around evidence-based evaluation. So there's um, perhaps more to come around standardization in another conversation with you and I. Um, but for now, just thank you so much for generously contributing your time and your expertise and helping us to think through when this model and this methodology and approach and even just the metrics listed could be useful to help us advance our work. And I'm grateful for your time and this work that you've contributed to our industry. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm also very thankful. I've enjoyed talking to you and um, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to perhaps another video conversation in the future. And until then, enjoy these calls to action listeners and stay tuned for more.